<laughs> okay, so he hello everyone. Welcome back to this Corpus Curiosum lecture series. Uh, this is our second session, but allow me to do a brief introduction for those who are, who are new here. Um, okay, so first of all, we want to share with you some important notes. The first one is, as we said, uh, we will be recording this introduction and the main talk because probably in the future we will publish uh, the, the recorded talks. However, you don't have to worry because we won't uh, record the discussion part. Okay, so regarding to the questions, please feel free to ask whatever you have in mind using the chat and uh, the chat that Zoom has. And you can make questions uh, at any time during the talk, but, but Verena will answer them at the end of the talk. And finally, regarding to the, to the length, this session will last for one hour and 30 minutes. So it means that we will close the session at 4, 3, uh, sorry, at 4 uh, 30 p.m. UK time. But of course, you are uh, free to leave when, whenever you want. OK, so moving on, maybe you are wondering why uh, our name is Corpus Curiosum. OK, so we were inspired by this big trap that you can see here, that it is the Corpus Callosum, at this uh, and you can find it um, linking the both hemispheres of the brain in the same way that we are aimed at linking people all around the world. So, okay. So who are we, who are us? Okay, so as, as we said at the beginning, we are four early uh, neuro, neuroscientists based in different uh, cities, as, for example, Madrid, London, and Barcelona. And we are ranking from postdoctoral, uh, yeah, postdoctoral researchers uh, to postgraduate students and PhD students. So, what about us? So, where for for this session we are totally astonished because you came from you came from 34 different countries, and not only 34 different countries, but also you have signed up from from. 75 institutions and companies. So we are totally uh, grateful and astonished with that. So thank you so much for the, for the support that you are giving us. Next, uh, well, I will introduce today's speaker. She is Verena Hayes, the Dr. Verena Hayes. And as you can see here, she's currently, she's currently a research fellow in, in the advanced study of, in Germany, sorry. And she made uh, two different degrees in molecular Biology and Neuroscience in Heidelberg and Oxford, and then she obtained he, her, her PhD in Psychiatry also in, in Oxford. Then she moved to Germany to do a short postdoctoral research fellow in, in the Center for Neuro, Neurodegenerative Diseases in, in Bonn, and then she came back to Oxford to do another master in, epidemi in, epidemi in epidemiology. Sorry. And now with, uh, uh, she's also involved in many different initiatives to do uh, neuroscience more credible and more reliable again. And she is why she, is, uh, she will be talking today about credibility in neuroscience. So, uh, Verena, you are here. <laughs> and so you can start whenever, whenever you feel ready. Brilliant. Fantastic. Yes, thank you so much for the kind introduction. And also, thank you so much for having me. I think it's super exciting to be here. I, I love the initiative. I, I love the idea to talk about sort of slightly tangential stuff in neuroscience that maybe we don't focus on as much as we should in our um, sort of in our research career, especially early on. And so I'm very excited to be talking about credibility in neuroscience. Maybe I should have been slightly more provocative and called this make neuroscience great again or something along those lines. Uh, but I hope credibility in neuroscience sounds good to everyone, too. So um, thanks very much for, for the intro in the sense that um, now you know everything about me. Um, I'd just like to start with this disclosure slide anyway, because I think it's important for people to understand where I'm coming from and, um, and sort of, you know, who pays me to do what. Um, and also I have a couple of uh, non-financial uh, disclosures as well. So I work with a number of different organizations, or I used to work um, uh, in the case of, of Oxford, I used to work with them. Um, uh, to really improve credibility and work on our research culture. And I think um, I'm, I'm just basically going to try to convince you in this talk that we currently do have issues with um, the quality of our own research. And so this is my own bias. This is the bias that I'm bringing to this talk. And I, I tend to think that it's important for everyone to know where sort of I'm coming from in, in, in this case. 
so what's the problem? And I'm, I'm not going to spend very much time on talking about the problem because I think that tends to be um, relatively clear to people who come to these kind of talks. So um, I, I guess the problem is, uh, in short, really is the replication or reproducibility crisis that we face at the moment. And I'd just like to start with some terminology because I think that's normally quite helpful to understand you know, what people are talking about. So uh, in my book, uh, at least, reproducible is a result that can be recreated by others if they use the same data and same analysis pipeline. Whereas what we're normally aiming for is having a replicable result so that people can reach the same scientific conclusion if they use independent data and possibly also an independent uh, analysis pipeline. So in my book, this is my definition, uh, the reproducibility crisis is really a crisis of replication rather than reproducibility. Um, right, and so I guess it all, uh, at least the, the talking about reproducibility crisis started at least for a lot of people with this large scale replication project um, in psychology, where they tried to replicate a hundred different experiments from the literature, and they found that they only managed to replicate around a third to a half of the original findings. And this has now been shown in lots of different areas, not just focused on neuroscience. So we have this in preclinical cancer research, where they've been talking about raising their standards for quite a while now, where they've uh, run a large scale reproducibility or replication project, um, as I would call it in cancer biology, which has uh, shown some really interesting results. Uh, partly, um, one of the, I think, most interesting parts that came out of this was that they didn't manage to replicate as many projects as, as they should, um, as they expected, partly because they couldn't find enough information um, in, the, in the papers to replicate things in the first place. And I think this is very interesting. It shows us that we seem to have a problem with um, describing our methods in enough detail so that others can uh, replicate um, our, our findings. But it's also in, uh, in, the, in a different area, which also touches on neuroscience uh, and machine learning, we have uh, problems with reproducibility as well. And I thought rather than giving you examples from neuroscience, it would be really interesting to see that this happens across the board. It doesn't uh, also just doesn't happen in uh, biomedical sciences. We see in uh, social sciences as well that they seem to have problems with um, uh, replication. Uh, again, this was a large scale replication project and they uh, managed um, to uh, to replicate around 60% of the findings in this case. So I think it's really interesting that this is an issue that uh, a lot of different areas are facing. Um, and uh, I, because I'm a neuroscientist, it's great that we talk about credibility in neuroscience, but I think we can, uh, we can talk about credibility in, in research in general, um, uh, rather than just neuroscience. And where does this come from? I think uh, that there are lots of different reasons, but I think one of the major issues that we currently face is that what we're getting rewarded for does, is not necessarily high quality research. So we get rewarded for um, you know, a large quantity of papers and our papers seem to be our only research outputs that we get rewarded for at the moment. And the other issue is that also, it's not about the sort of quality of the research in, it, itself that's being published. It's about the impact factor of the journal uh, that we publish in. And this is a huge problem because impact factor um, you know, does have sort of some correlation potentially with quality, although I would actually dispute that. But I think um, the more important thing is that um, impact factor was never designed to look at, you know, the quality of an individual um, paper. Uh, and when, when you're thinking about high impact factor journals like Nature, Nature and Science, what do they publish? Well, they publish the really exciting, sexy, surprising results. And if you think about it, a sur surprising result actually in a lot of cases is a false positive result. And so I think this is a huge problem that we're looking at at the moment. Uh, why do we care? I'll, I'll spend a couple of minutes on the question why I care, uh, really. And I think for a lot of neuroscientists that will probably uh, resonate with you. So um, the reason why I'm doing neuroscience is because I want my stuff to be, my research to be of use in the clinic in some way. And this is a, a paper, again, that was sort of a replication project that was done by the pharma company Bayer, I think, if I remember correctly. And what they uh, did, they took um, findings from the academic literature and tried to replicate them in their own lab. They only managed to replicate around 30% of the findings. So again, this is a huge problem if you think about it, that um, you know, pharma companies are dependent on the, the literature being relatively sound so that they don't waste too much time and money um, on, on, on replicating research that's unsound. And so if, if they can't rely on the uh, literature that comes from, from us as academics in most cases, and then we have huge problems developing new drugs. And I think in neurosciences in general, I think we can say that we, we have seen over the last um, you know, decades actually, that we seem to have huge problems with translating stuff from preclinical to, um, to clinical use in the end. 
but it's also an ethical issue for me. So first of all, if you have, um, if you have a, a, a clinical uh, project that's, um, that has come out of preclinical data that's unsound, then in the worst case scenario, you might be putting patients at risk. Um, if you have, uh, if you work in animal research, and I have done that uh, for quite a while in, in my own research, then we always have to remember that we're sacrificing animals in the end. You know, we're killing them after we're done with our studies. And I think we have a duty to get the science uh, as right as we possibly can if we're killing animals for it. And then the last point is uh, maybe more mundane, but I think it's also an important one. So there, there is a paper that says we're wasting up to 85% of research funding on unreliable research. You know, maybe this uh, figure is a bit too high, maybe it's not 85%, maybe it's more around 50%, but I think that really doesn't matter because still it's, uh, you know, if you're thinking about it, uh, if you think about the budgets that we have in the US, um, in, in Europe, then this is still gonna be billions of, uh, of pounds, euros, uh, dollars, whichever, um, whichever currency you, you like. So, you know, we're thinking about all the ways that we're creating. I think it's, it's uh, also an ethical issue. It's also about trust and evidence. And I thought uh, I could give you lots of examples from, from the current Corona crisis, obviously. Uh, but rather than doing that, you know, let's not talk about Corona for a while uh, and just think about someone who is currently a very um, important politician who doesn't believe in, in evidence in the biomedical area or in uh, around climate change. And I think the problem here is if I don't trust my own results, if I don't trust my colleagues' results, then why would we expect politicians? Why would we expect the public to trust that we're doing something useful and that we're, that we're doing it right and that we're getting the evidence right. So I think this is a very high level issue, but I think it's an important one to mention. And if you're thinking this is way too high level for you, I think there are really, really good selfish reasons for why you actually want to work reproducibly too. And Florian has, um, uh, has summarized them very nicely in, in this paper. Uh, and one of, one of the ideas is that basically the person who's most likely to try and reproduce your own results is your future self. And there is no way that you can email your past self from six months ago and say, hey, do you remember how I analyzed that data set? Um, and so in, in some way, you know, when you're, because all of us will be looking at our data sets um, later on, you know, for, for example, when, you, when we're doing peer review, the process can take months to years. And sometimes a reviewer asks you to go, to go back to your data and reanalyze some parts of it. And that's only possible if you have a good workflow for how you analyze your data in the first place. And secondly, only uh, if you're able to find your data as well. So there are really good selfish reasons for why you want to work reproducibly. And rather than talking about the problem for the whole time, I thought it's a lot more interesting to talk about solutions, uh, especially from the sort of perspective of early career researchers. Um, and I'm, I'm one of you too, so um, I always feel like I can, I can sort of sympathize with a lot of the issues that we're facing. And so my sort of approach to, to the solution to this problem is really twofold. So one is one part and very important part is certainly open science, uh, especially those part of, parts of open science or open data using open source software, open methods and open access publishing. But it's also about open research culture, which is not on that, um, on that list uh, that uh, Andreas Neuhold came up with. And this is really about the question, um, also very you know, current issue, like who's taking part in research, um, who, who gets to participate, who gets to be a researcher, um, who gets to become a professor. And so this is partly about also changing our culture from uh, looking at who has the power and, and who should have the power in the end. And the second ingredient to, um, to opening up our processes is, is really good research practice and thinking about what does good research practice actually look like. And I, I sometimes have the impression that this is something we don't tend to talk about very much when we study you know, biology or wherever we come from, we don't tend to talk very much about research practice and what it looks like. And so I'm gonna try in the next sort of 20 minutes, I'll try and um, go through the cycle of a research project. And at each of these indiv individual stages, think about what good research uh, practice looks like and how open uh, practices um, uh, can be a part of that uh, too. So the first, uh, first and very important step is, re uh, step is really asking the right question. And I think one way in which we can ask right questions is doing proper literature reviews. And this is something that we don't tend to do very much. Um, sometimes we do systematic reviews, but certainly not as much as we should. And again, that depends very much on which area in neuroscience you come from. But I think it's incredibly useful to either look for systematic reviews that others have done um, or do one yourself so that you can understand where are the gaps in the literature and what is it that I should be looking at. We tend to just focus on the one or two papers that sort of you know, come with the hypotheses or confirm the hypotheses that we have. 
and then not look further in the literature. And I think that's a, uh, that can lead to a huge waste of, of time and effort if we're replicating stuff that's been done before. And just if you think, well, meta-analysis doesn't really apply to uh, my field of study, um, you can look at uh, neuroimaging meta-analyses. Um, you can look at uh, uh, meta-analyses of um, animal preclinical research. And there are lots of ways in which to do this. Uh, and I think the second step is really about um, speaking to colleagues, speaking to clinicians, if you're not a clinician yourself, and uh, potentially involving uh, pub the public or um, patients as well in your research question. Um, and you can get very easily in touch with, with members of the public nowadays via social media, via citizen science projects. And for me, this is all about being open and, and collaborating already at the start of your project when you're thinking about what is a useful question to ask. And sometimes when you're asking question, uh, patients, you know, what's the question that you want answered, you, you can get very surprising answers that you didn't even think about. Right, so the next step is really study design, and I think study design is where a lot of this goes wrong, so I'll spend actually quite a bit of time on this. And I think the first question should always be, do you need to collect new data? And this is not an advertisement for Google Dataset Search at all. I have to admit, I have never used it. Um, I, I have my own uh, way of finding data sets, but I think what I, I'd like to say here is that uh, my own research has been transformed by, um, by a huge large-scale neuroimaging data set that we can now use, which is called the UK Biobank, which has currently data for 40,000 participants. And 40,000 is obviously a huge step change from you know, the 100 that I managed to collect in, in my PhD project. And so this uh, allows me to answer questions in much more detail than I, want to, than I, than I ever thought would be possible. And so think about um, whether you actually need to collect new data or whether there are data sets out there that you can use. And then I think at the study design stage, it's also um, really good to think about the reporting guidelines that you will need to follow when you're writing up your paper. And there are a, a number of different reporting guidelines that you can find on the Equator Network website. Um, I've just got two examples here from the neuroimaging world and from animal preclinical studies that are incredibly useful to try and understand, okay, if I need to report this in my paper later on, then this is something that I probably need to uh, worry about in my study design as well. So I think they are very useful to look at at the study design stage. And then when it comes to designing your study, I think it's all about three big questions. And I'd love to spend an hour on each of these, but I don't have enough time. So I'll, uh, I'll just talk about them very briefly. So one is the question, how do you deal with bias? And this can be the bias that you bring to your research as, your, uh, as a researcher. But as you probably know from clinical trials, there's also you know, patients bring their own biases. And that's why, why what we do in, in clinical trials is blinding everyone. So the patient is blinded as to whether they're in the placebo or drug group. Or the researcher is blinded what, uh, as to what they get and so on. And this might not always be possible, but, but I think it's very important that, you, that you're clear about the biases that are inherent in your study design. Then secondly, the question is, how do you deal with confounders? And I guess the most important confounders for most of our research will be sex and age, for example. And uh, already at the study design stage, you can think about how to deal with those. Um, you don't have to wait for the analysis stage to sort of try and uh, mathematically account for confounders. And then the last question is, how do you deal with chance? And um, you know, how do you ensure that your, your chances of getting a false negative or false positive results are relatively low? And for most of us, the answer to the, the chance question will really be about statistical power and sample size. Um, and there is, in most cases, no way around getting as large sample sizes as we possibly can, which is also why I talked so much about um, you know, finding data sets that others have potentially uh, collected before. And there's this really nice paper from Kate Button and others um, where they looked at power failure and small sample sizes in neuroscience. And um, the take home is that the median statistical power in neuroscience is somewhere around 20%. Um, in animal studies, it can be up to 30. In uh, neuroimaging, at least in the studies that they looked at, which, you know, it's a slightly older paper by now, it's around 8%. And why is this a problem? Well, the chance of finding a false negative is 1 minus power. So uh, in the case of neuroimaging studies, it would be 90, 92%. And what you're normally aiming for with statistical power is somewhere between 80 and 90%, not 8%. But also, I think this is a concept that we don't talk about very much. Um, if you get a positive result, um, the chances that this is a uh, true positive and not a false positive is actually very low if you have low statistical power. And that's what's called a low positive predictive value. Um, I guess many of you won't have heard of that um, term before. And so I really recommend uh, this paper to you um, to, to, to try and understand what they are talking about. And this is just sort of an 
illustrative example of what we're talking about when we think about sample sizes. So if you're looking of, uh, for an effect size of 0.5, which is sort of a, a medium effect size, and I think it's not unrealistic that you're looking at that kind of size of effect, and you want a statistical power of 90%, an alpha of 0.05, and you do a one sample, one tail t test, which is sort of the simplest way of looking at this kind of question, um, then you need 36 participants for your group. And that's 36 humans, 36 animals, uh, 36 different cells, whatever you're looking at, uh, individual um, measurements. If you have two groups and you do an independent uh, group's two-tailed t-test, you need 86 participants per group. And this is just to illustrate that um, either, you know, if you're looking for huge effect sizes, you can get away with um, small sample sizes. But I think for, for most of us, the kind of effect size that we're looking at will be medium to small. And in that case, uh, we actually need to think much more about what the correct sample size would be for our case. Brilliant, so once you have your study design, um, really I think what you should be doing is pre-registration. And what does that mean? Well, it's, uh, the idea comes from clinical trials and I, I guess many of you will have heard of that. So what you do in a clinical trial is you write up the hypothesis, study design and detailed analysis pipeline before you start data collection. And that's exactly the same for your pre-registration. And the point here is that for a clinical trial, it's very important that people don't change their outcomes, for example, that they don't see the data and then they say, oh yes, this is what we wanted to look at um, all along and, and that actually wasn't the case. Um, so what you do is exactly the same. You write up the hypothesis, study design and analysis pipeline. You can pre-register this online. There are some registries for that nowadays, like the open science framework. And the point is that you can still do exploratory research. There's no doubt that you can do it but you have to label it as, as such in your paper. So in your paper, you say, this was hypothesis driven, this is the hypothesis driven part, and then hang on, you know, I, I found some really exciting stuff just by doing some exploring and analyzing my data to death. Um, but the point is that your study will be powered to look at your main hypothesis. And so you should really um, try and distinguish, you know, from your main, your main hypothesis from the exploratory part. Um, your pre-registration uh, will be published online, but you can put an embargo on it. So you can say, it's just, it's um, going to be uh, closed and uh, people can't read it for, you know, two to five years, however long you like. Um, but the point is that it's going to be on, uh, available online at some point so that other people can ask you about the results and basically so that it becomes clear what kind of uh, studies are being done. And if you want more information, um, you, can, uh, you can find more information on this link here. Um, sorry, I didn't say that in the beginning, but my slides are online so you can, um, you can find them. The link will be at the end of my talk. And so why is pre-registration pre useful? Um, well, it deals with two uh, very important issues. It deals with p-hacking. So p-hacking is where you uh, analyze the data in hundreds of different ways, um, but you basically only publish in your, in your, um, in your paper the one, the one way that gave you a significant result. So if you, I guess we all know the problem that if you run 100 diff different tests, just by definition, you're gonna get five um, false positives. But if you only report those five, false positives and you don't report the uh, 95 other tests that you did, then people will get the wrong impression of your, um, of your data set and of your results. And it also deals with harking. So harking is hypothesizing after the results are known. Um, and that's, that's the problem that you basically change your story after you've seen the results. And when you pre-register, you can't do that. You say, you know, this was my story, this was my hypothesis, and here is what I found um, uh, later when I analyzed the data. Um, and if we want to deal with publication bias and low statistical power, there is a new manuscript format that we can use um, to do that, which I think is, is very exciting, actually. And this is called registered report. So this is sort of pre-registration on, on steroids, if you like. So the idea is here that you get um, peer-reviewed after you've designed the study. So you haven't collected and analyzed the data yet. You haven't written it up yet. You actually get peer review after the study design stage. And I think this is incredibly exciting because this is where peer reviewers can pick up that there's something wrong with your design and you have to change your design um, to actually look at the question that you're interested in. And so the peer reviewers can actually change um, your study quite a lot, but I think in a positive way. So it's not the case where you get peer review at the end of the paper where they tell you, oh, you did it all wrong, you should have done it this way. Um, actually, you know, if you get um, peer review early on, um, you can still change your, your study in, in a positive way. And the point here is that if you, um, if you pass the stage one peer review, then the journal is gonna say, great, we're gonna publish your, um, your study. If you collect and analyze the data in the way that you said, and uh, the stage two peer review, is really just to, to check that you analyze and collected the data um, in the way that you said. It's not to check whether you got significant results because that's not the point of this, 
So even if you get null results, if you get negative results, your study is going to get published. Um, right, and this gets around low statistical power as well, because in order to get a registered report published, you have to have certain statistical power. In most cases, that will be around 90%. And uh, maybe even more importantly, it also gets around publication bias. So publication bias is the issue that we only um, tend to publish a significant or positive results. And we tend to bury the sort of negative and null results because we seem to have the impression that they don't get published as, as well as, uh, as we'd like, or it's more difficult, more complicated to publish them. And that's a huge problem because then a lot of people don't know about the, um, uh, the negative results and they might redo a, a study that's been done before, but just because the data and because the the study wasn't published, they didn't know that they would get um, null results. So publication bias um, is a huge issue that we're facing. And uh, I think registered reports are a great way around it because then, um, you know, if your study is gonna be published irrespective of the results, then we don't have to worry about publication bias too much. Um, at least hope, at least that's the hope for this. And I think there, is, there are some early findings from registered reports that this is actually the case. So actually, we're pretty bad at hypothesizing. And in a lot of cases, biology is, or you know, life is, is different from what we expected. So we get not, lots of null results uh, and lots of negative results if we're using registered reports. But I think this is just a reflection of reality. So I think this is a lot more, a lot closer to reality than the current situation where we just publish, you know, hey, we found something exciting and, and amazing and it fits our story. Brilliant, so we are done with study design. Um, then we're going to talk about data collection and analysis. And the problem here is that it's slightly difficult to, um, to generalize because that will depend very much on, um, on uh, your, your specific area of research. But I'll try to, I, I try to come up with some um, general comments that should still apply anyway. So again, the first question I think is, do you need a new method? And that's a new method to either acquire your data or analyze your data. There are some great websites nowadays that you can check like protocols.io um, that, um, that have published uh, um, protocols from other groups that are hopefully well established. Um, and so they have been tested, you know, multiple times and not just, you know, the one time that you're going to test it in your own lab. And so hopefully this is going to give you uh, more, um, more reliable results. And then when you're thinking about the measures that you're going to use in your study, it's about two main questions. So one is about the validity of your measures. So do you get the right answer? And the second one is about reliability. So do you get the same answer twice? And just to illustrate those issues, basically what you want is a measure that's, um, uh, that's so, so there are, obviously what you want is a measure that's valid and reliable. So it's valid um, and that's on the right hand side here. So it's valid because it's in the bullseye of the target practice and it's reliable because it's always in the bullseye. But it's actually very unlikely that we tend to get those measures. Um, in, in which case you can um, still get, a, get something useful out of a measure that's reliable but not valid. So in this case, it's reliable because it's always in the same corner, but it's not valid because it's not in the bullseye. And you could think of, for example, um, of a scale that's always off by five kilograms. And so in this case, if you know that it's always off by five kilograms, then you know what you need to, that you need to multiply the measure that you get by five, uh, or you need, um, or you, in this case, you know, you need to add five, you don't need to multiply it. Um, and then you get, uh, you get a valid measure as well. So it's, it can still be useful if you can compare this measure with a sort of well-established one, if you have something that's reliable but not valid and you know the correction factor. Um, if you have a measure that's uh, valid on average, so if you take the average of all of these points, um, they will end up somewhere in the bullseye, but it's not reliable. Then again, this can be a useful measure because all you need to do is take lots of measurements and then you can take the average and you know that you will uh, end up with something that's useful. Um, you obviously don't want to end up in a situation where you have a measure that's not valid and not reliable. Um, so hopefully you will have one of the other cases. So how reliable and valid are your tests is something that you should ask yourself. Can you compare them with a gold standard or well-established test? If yes, I think my first question would actually be why don't you use the gold standard or well-established test? Um, and also, are you doing any quality control? And if yes, of what? So um, there are so many different things that will play a role in your experiment, your experimental setup, the reagents that you use, the data that you acquire, the computer code that you write to analyze the data. And I think it's very important to think about quality control steps um, at, at each of these individual points in your, um, in your data analysis and data collection, uh, data collection and analysis phase. Then uh, when you're writing analysis pipelines, like me, I'm not a software engineer, but I'm writing my own analysis pipelines. 
still try to use well-established tools and try and follow good programming practice, um, especially if you haven't been trained uh, very well in software, um, in, in coding, I guess. Uh, and one of the, the ways in which you can um, uh, in which you can increase the quality of your project is really thinking about embedding replication from the start. I guess many of us will be aware of uh, what we, we are currently doing with genome-wide association studies, where the practice is basically that you have to replicate um, your findings in two different samples, and otherwise you don't uh, get published. And I think this is a, is a really interesting way of, of um, because I think you, you will always be the expert in the, with a specific setup, with a specific project that you're doing. So if you can embed replication in your project already, then you're not dependent on other people trying to replicate it. And maybe it's also going to be sort of cheaper and more efficient for you to be able to do it rather than asking someone else to replicate your project. And always remember there should be no miracles. You know, it should be super easy to understand for you, you know, when you come back to the project in a year or in five years, it should be super easy to understand how you got from the data to your result uh, and even how you got from your sort of study design to the data. Uh, and in order to be able to do that, you need reproducible workflows. And these are just a number of different uh, electronic lab notebook softwares um, that can be useful in that case. And again, that will depend very much on the type of research that you're doing. I personally use our markdown, but I could also have gone for Jupyter notebooks. Uh, and there are also some really good uh, electronic lab notebook softwares uh, for, for lab-based work, for example. Uh, and also think about data management. And this is actually something you should probably think about at the study design stage. How do you want to do, manage your data so that it will be relatively easy for you to, um, to find it? Uh, and also for, for your PI to be able to find it when you're gone from the lab, for example. And I personally use the Open Science Framework for that. Um, there might be other ways of doing this. Uh, I'm not claiming that the Open Science Framework is the best um, tool by, or best looking tool, um, but I think it does the job for me. And so that's, that's why I personally use it. And then also think about statistical practice. I think especially in neuroscience, um, many of us seem to have problems with stats. Um, at least that's what this paper claims here. So I think it's, it's very important that we get the stats right, obviously. But I think that's, that's, a, that's a problem that many of us are already aware of. Right, so the last stage of your research project is about interpretation and publishing. And I sort of summarize those two as open reporting. And so uh, really this is on the one hand about publishing all the analyses you did. So you might have pre-registered something and then you did some exploratory stuff. Please publish all of that so that people know what you've done with the data set. And then also, and that goes without saying, I guess, publish all the results you get, not just the significant ones. That follows on from basically what I've been talking about the whole time. Publish according to best practice guidelines. And these are the guidelines that I've mentioned before that you can find on the Equator Network. And also be honest about your biases and conflicts of interest. And this is not just, you know, most of us seem to think that, well, I'm, I'm not working with a pharma company, so I don't really have a conflict of interest. Well, actually, it's not that simple. I think we all have conflicts of interest when, when it comes to publishing, because really what we need to get ahead in our career is a paper. So, you know, we have, uh, we, we are always interested in maybe proving the hypotheses that we had and maybe making our results sound more exciting than they are. And it's all also about interpretation. So somebody else might interpret the data in a completely different way if they come, um, come at the project with a different hypothesis. So really this is about being honest about saying, well, I interpret it in this way because X, um, but you might also want to interpret it in another way if your, um, if your premise, if your hypothesis is different. I think as early career researchers, it's incredibly useful to, to use preprints. And I think they've been in the news quite a bit over the last couple of months. Um, so I guess most of you will be familiar with this. So basically the idea is that you publish the, the final PDF of your, um, of your paper that you send um, for review on a preprint server. And there are lots of different ones like BioArchive, MedArchive, and the Open Science Framework has some as well. And the point is that while it's undergoing review, and as we know, review can take uh, you know, months to years in some cases, um, this paper is online already and can be read. And it can be read by future employers which is incredibly useful so that future employers can get an idea of what you've um, done before. But it's also read by, um, by funding agencies. So at least in the UK, there are now some funders that allow you to put uh, preprints on your publication list and they count as a normal publication, which is amazing, especially for early career researchers because the peer review process takes so long. And then um, just uh, to show you what you see on this example here, so this is a preprint, but it also says where, where it's been published and it um, gets the, the information about the publication uh, when it's uh, published in a proper journal. 
Right, and the last point is publishing open access. Um, I think at least in the UK, this is really not a debate uh, at the moment. All the funders are basically making you publish, publish open access. And I think that's exact, absolutely the right thing to do. I wouldn't argue with that. And I'm also not discussing open access because I fully agree that we all should be publishing with immediate open access. Um, if you want to have a discussion around that later on, I'm very happy to do so, but I thought um, I shouldn't waste too much time on that. But it's not just about publishing a paper, it's also about publishing data and materials. And I think this is where our CVs are going to change in the future. So this is about publishing research, what I would call research output. And research output is not just a paper. Um, incredibly valuable research output can be a data set that's used by others. Um, if you're using, uh, if you're developing an amazing uh, protocol, for example, that's used by others as open material, then this uh, is also incredibly useful for the, for the whole scientific enterprise. So I think the, the, the atmosphere is certainly changing uh, to making research outputs count beyond just papers. And this is where you will want to have good sort of data management structures and, and um, ways of, of uh, making your materials openly available. Um, as, a, as someone who works with human data in neuroimaging, I totally know that there are limits to open data. Uh, and I think there are very uh, important reasons why you would not, not want to publish data from your, um, uh, from your study for privacy reasons, for example. Um, but still, uh, the, you can, I, I, still, I think it's very important that you think about those issues, um, maybe even at the start of your project, not even when you're finished with it. Um, and then it's about, you know, where do you go to? There are lots of different data repositories. Again, that depends very much on the type of data that you have. There are some generalist repositories like the Open Science Framework, uh, where I uh, have this uh, demo project page again. And the great thing about the OSF is that they have this very uh, wonderful button here that says make public. And so you can go to the, the parts of your um, project that you want to make publicly available. So it might be an ethics application, it might be your experimental paradigm, whichever part of your project you want to make available, you can make this available uh, just with a click of a button. And that makes life obviously super easy for you. So just to summarize, robust research is to me about two things. It's about open research, opening your data materials and reporting, and it's about good research practice and integrating those two different things. And this is uh, just for me to remind, uh, my, remind myself to take a breath, but also to let, to let you take a breath, because I think I've covered a lot of ground here. And um, I can totally understand if, if people are overwhelmed and they think, oh my God, I need to change my practices completely. And this is not the, the point of my talk. Um, the point is just to show you lots of different solutions that you can potentially use in your, in your lab, but you don't have to use all of them. I think it's great if people just pick one or two things that they want um, from this kind of talk and that they want to delve uh, into it a bit more deeply and, and think about um, how they can integrate those in their own practices. And you might know the, um, uh, the UK supermarket called Tesco, which has this tagline, every little helps. And this is really what I would like to say to you too. So every little helps, you know, if you change your practices just a tiny little bit, I think, you know, you've all, you're already changing the world. And uh, yes, I'm all for changing the world because in the end, it's not just about your own practices. It's about changing the whole system we work in. It's about uh, the institutions that we work with, the professional societies, the funders, the publishers. Everyone has to have an interest in, in making things more open, in improving the quality of the research that we do. And unless that happens, then just you changing something as a researcher will make a difference uh, in, in your own field. But if you, if you don't get rewarded for that, then it might actually make your, your life much more difficult and you might not have a career. So I, I always say it's not risk-free and I always say I'm, the, the path that I'm taking in my own research is not risk-free. Uh, I might not end up in, in, um, in academia. I might not be able to get a, uh, a position as a PI at some point. But I think, um, uh, I think I, I'm, a, I'm an idealist. I want to be able to do research the way that I think it should be done. And if that means I can't succeed in academia, then so be it. Um, then I'll find a job elsewhere that's a nine to five job where I can uh, make lots more money. Uh, but my point really is about, um, you know, us working together, uh, even early career researchers can, can change the world. Um, and I think this is what we've seen over the last couple of years with Reproducible Research Oxford, um, which partly developed out of a sort of a crazy group of people um, with our list of demands, you know, unicorns, rainbows, puppies, and open science. Um, so we started our initiative uh, around three years ago and it was, um, in the first place, uh, mostly early career researchers in lots of different fields. Like I said in the beginning, the replication crisis and the problems around quality of research results 
um, uh, appear in lots of different fields. And so we came together to think about what we can do. And we were supported by some amazing PIs and also by collaborations with the library. And this ha has now turned into something much bigger um, uh, with the aims of really improving training, because on the one hand, we don't get trained on how to do uh, open science, for example, but also thinking about the kind of infrastructure that we need, incentivizing open and reproducible research so that people actually get rewarded for what they do and for the time they put into it. And also thinking about creating a meta research community so that people who do meta research, who do research on research, so research on improving the system, can actually have a community of other people to talk to. And the things that we've done is we've focused mostly on training in the first couple of years, partly because all training needs is some uh, early career researchers, um, like the, the people who organized the series here, who get together and decide, you know, we want to do something about it because it's really cheap. It's really cheap to run training. It just requires your own time. And so I haven't been involved in all of these different things. Um, my, my main involvement has been to set up the Berlin Oxford Summer School and Open Research, which is a, a five day a summer school where we have lectures and workshops on, um, on the issues that I talked about today. But there were others who set up seminar series, journal clubs, um, there were software and data carpentry workshops to teach people programming. And we've also run sort of one day workshops uh, as the Oxford Reproducibility School. And we're not crazy, we're not the only ones doing that. So um, the Reproducible Research Oxford is now officially the, um, the Oxford node of the UK Reproducibility Network, where again, some uh, PIs got together and thought, you know, we need to do something about the problem. And they are now doing some amazing lobby activities uh, in the UK. And um, I guess the, where it comes to credibility in neuroscience, um, there are some societies like the British Neuroscience Association that have realized that this is a huge issue. Uh, and I can really recommend uh, this website. Um, and as a disclaimer, in the, you know, I said in the beginning, I work with this. Uh, with, with these people. So um, uh, yes, I have an interest in, in get, getting you to use that website too. But I think it's um, very important that there are professional societies that are interested in this topic too. So it's not like you, you don't feel like you're the crazy person and the only person who cares about this. There are lots of other um, people out there that, that do this nowadays. And this is how I'd like to end. I'd just like to say thank you to all the people that I work with. And I'm sure I forgot one or two. So apologies to them. Um, thanks for your attention and uh, please don't be shy, get in touch, um, either if you have any questions now, ask them now. If you have questions later, just email me and you can find my slides on the Open Science Framework. So thank you.